Well, good morning again, uh, Center Church. My name is Josh Miller, like I said earlier, and I'm one of the pastors here. If you're a guest with us, I'm, I'm thrilled that you joined us. However you found us online, through a friend, some other way, do me a favor, uh, right below this live stream, click the connect button, and that way we can follow up with you this week to see if there are ways that we can be praying for you or walking with you in this season of life. Well, today we come to the end of our study in the book of Philippians. So we've been in the book of Philippians for the last several weeks, and today the Apostle Paul is going to talk about a topic that is integral to all of our lives, okay? It's a topic that we would all like more of in our lives. It's something that we seek after, that we look for even when we don't realize it, but it continues to remain just outside of our grasp. So what could I possibly be talking about? It's this topic, contentment. Contentment. And I'm not talking about the contentment you feel after a long day at work when you sit down on the couch and you've got your Chipotle takeout and you turn on your new Netflix show. I'm not talking about that kind of contentment. I'm talking about deep soul level satisfaction. I'm talking about feeling wholeness. I'm talking about nothing is going right in your world, things are bad, and yet you still have this deep rooted poise because you are content. You are full of joy and peace. That is what I am talking about. The amazing statement that the Apostle Paul makes in our text today is that he found that, that he possessed that kind of contentment, that even though his circumstances were terrible, even though his life was very, very difficult, he had deep-rooted satisfaction and joy. He had enough no matter what life threw at him, right? He makes a claim that he found that. And if you're like me, if you would like to have more of that in your life, then stick with me over the next 30 minutes as we explore what Paul has to say about contentment. Because here's what I think is probably true about you. You can resonate with this statement that I found online this week as I was doing research. You ready? Contentment isn't in our vocabulary. We're told the key to life is happiness, but we continue searching for what exactly unlocks that door. We tell ourselves, I'll be happy when I'm married or as soon as I lose weight or just after that next promotion, right? We swear we'll be content as soon as we achieve those goals within reach. What no one tells us is there's no end to those wish lists and nothing to mark when we've reached the summit. I thought that was a powerful expose of just someone writing about her experience longing for contentment. And if you're anything like me, you can relate with that and you want the kind of contentment that Paul talks about here. So he's going to talk about how he found that contentment, and by looking at what he has to say, we can learn how we can find more of that contentment in our lives as well. So wherever you are, whether you are a skeptic, a seasoned saint, or somewhere in between, track with me for the next 30 minutes, because I think it's going to be incredibly relevant for your life, particularly in the season that we're walking through that is a very challenging season. So if you have a Bible, you can type to or turn to Philippians chapter 4, starting in verse 10. That is where we are going to be today. And here's what verse 10 says. You ready? I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. So no opportunity to show it. So Paul starts off by saying, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly. And if you've been with us through the Philippians series, you know that the Apostle Paul finds a lot of reasons to rejoice. He's always rejoicing in this letter. Well, why is he rejoicing in this particular instance? It's because the Philippian church had revived their concern for Paul. They had heard about his hardship, and they had sent a gift to relieve his affliction. This is what happened. Their affection for Paul had translated into action. And this is a very important principle within Christianity. Faith should produce works and truth should lead to action. Faith should produce works and truth should lead to action. And I know for some of you, this principle has weighed very heavily on your heart over the last several weeks as our country has been going through extraordinary unrest as we, as we start to grapple with the reality of racism and of racial injustice in our society. Like I said at the beginning of our service, you've seen the social media posts, you've heard us pray and lament about this, but you ask, what are we going to do? How are we going to make a difference? Well, after consulting with a number of pastors and community leaders, our staff has put together a working document to help us as a church take steps forward in, in addressing racism and racial injustice in light of the gospel. Some aspects of that plan we've been doing since we started this church, and other aspects of that plan will be new for us. And we're calling this our Ephesians 2 plan, our Ephesians 2 plan based off of Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14, which says this, for he himself, Jesus Christ, is our peace, who has made us both one 
and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. We believe that in the gospel, the dividing walls of race and class that, that separate so many of us do not have to separate believers. That in the gospel of Jesus Christ, those barriers have been broken down, but it is the responsibility of individual churches to apply that truth. That just knowing that is true will not change how we relate to one another, but we have to do the hard work of applying what we believe, of allowing our truth to lead us to action. And our Ephesians 2 plan is an attempt for us to start doing that. And this plan has three major components within it, relationships, education, and engagement. First, we believe that strong relationships between Christians of different races is one of the most effective ways of increasing awareness, empathy, and understanding as it relates to racism and ongoing racial injustice in our society. So we are going to start intentionally calling the members of Center Church to build diverse relationships in our city, and we are taking intentional steps as a church to build partnerships with churches that look very different than us. We're also intentionally inviting brothers of African-American descent to come and preach God's word to us on a regular basis so that we are hearing from our brothers of color. That starts next weekend as my brother and friend, Pastor K.J. Washington, will be here to preach God's word to us. He is the pastor and lead planter of New Valley Church in Waynesboro, Virginia, and I'm so thrilled to have him with us. So we are going to be pursuing strong relationships. Second, we believe that education helps us better understand the history of racism and racial injustice in our society and the impact it has had today. So we're going to be taking steps to educate ourselves as a staff, as an elder team, and as a church to better understand what is happening right now in our society. And one way that we're going to take that step is tonight, 8 p.m., in the conversation hosted by Charlottesville Community Church, an opportunity for us to just listen and to learn and to be educated. So I hope you'll join us for that. Thirdly, we believe that faith should produce works. We believe that what we believe theologically should result in action. And so we are continuing to develop partnerships with organizations here in our city that address injustice and oppression right here in our back Yard. We already have multiple partnerships with organizations that do that, but we are actively in conversation with organizations that specifically address racism and racial injustice. All the details of that plan can be found on our homepage following this service. If you click on the button that says Ephesians 2 plan, it is not a perfect plan. It is, it is not the final word on this topic, but it is a step forward that our elders and pastors are saying, hey, we want to lead forward in this. We want to take a step, and we believe that this will help us do it. So we learn from Paul. We learn that he was, he was encouraged. He rejoiced because the Philippian church allowed their faith to result in action. They didn't just say, hey, Paul, we care about you. We love you. But they said, we're going to do something about it, and he rejoiced in that. But I want you to see something else in Paul's, uh, in Paul's letter that is really, really important. Look at verse 11 with me. He says this. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity to show it. You see, it had been a while since the Philippians had sent Paul any aid. But I love what Paul does here. Do you see what he does? He assumes the best about the Philippians. He assumes the best about the Philippians. He assumed that they cared for him and that they loved him. They just hadn't had an opportunity to show it. Friends, this is really, really important for us to put into practice. Just as by faith we must act, so also by faith we must assume the best about others. Just as by faith we must act, so also by faith we must assume the best about others. I want to encourage you, wherever you are on this spectrum, to assume that your fellow church members and pastors care deeply about the gospel and they care deeply about issues of justice and racial reconciliation. I want to encourage you to approach this issue and every issue within the body of Christ with a posture of humility, with a heart attitude that assumes the best about other people. Practically, what does that look like? Well, I'll, I'll give you a couple ideas. Practically, that means come asking questions before you express criticism. Come asking questions before you express criticism. One of the things I had to learn the hard way when I was younger was that oftentimes I didn't see the whole picture. I didn't know all that was going on. I didn't know all the aspects of a conversation. And more than once, I would march into my boss's office and I'd say, here's the six things that I'm frustrated about. He would listen patiently and he would say, okay, Josh, here's the big picture. And I would walk out with my tail between my legs because I realized I hadn't gone in humbly. I hadn't gone in saying, hey, Pastor Mike, can you help me understand why we're making the kind of decisions that we are? I went in with accusations. So I just want to encourage you 
When you get really, really fired up about something, when you're passionate about something, that's good, but come assuming the best about others and ask questions to gain understanding before you express criticism or concern. Here's a second, here's a second idea, a way to put this into practice. Express your questions in person, not via email. Express your questions in person, not via email. Anytime that we express ourselves via email, two things happen. Number one, it's very difficult to control tone. It's hard to know what the tone is of a conversation, right? If you get a really long email, you just sort of assume that the person's mad at you. And number two, it's very easy to forget that the person on the other side of that communication is a person. Hasn't that happened to you before? It's, you just, when you're talking person to person, you just realize their humanity. And you say, man, this person has questions and frustrations and hardships and emotions and feelings and a family and all these things. But when we communicate online or on social media, we, we just forget that the people that we're dialoguing with are made in the image of God. And even if we disagree with them, even if we find their position really challenging to understand, they are still valuable and they're still worthy of dignity. So wherever you are, on, on the issues that we're all dealing with right now about racial injustice and ongoing racism, about the coronavirus and how we should be responding, I just want to encourage you to come with a posture of humility and to never forget that no matter how differently you believe about a topic, the person that you were talking with was created by God in His image, and He loves them and He is valuable to them, so treat them that way. See, Paul, Paul was excited that they had revived their concern for him, but he believed by faith the best about the Philippians, and he said, I, I knew, I knew that you loved me. I knew that you cared about me. You just hadn't had an opportunity to show it. Next, Paul says in verse 11, this is where he starts talking about contentment. Not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. And that word content that he uses in Greek has the sense of completeness or sufficiency. So Paul is saying that even when my life is extremely difficult, I have enough. No matter how much I have, I have enough. I am sufficient and I am complete. I have learned contentment. And then he tells us what that looks like for him. Verse 12, I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. So in these verses, Paul makes the astounding statement that he has learned the secret of contentment, that he has found that deep soul-level satisfaction that you and I long for, but we can never seem to get our arms around. And I just want to point out two quick things from these verses about contentment that we can learn from Paul. So if you're a note-taker, you could write this down. Number one, contentment is a secret you must learn. Contentment is a secret you must learn. Do you see how Paul used that phrase, I have learned, in verse 11 and then again in verse 12, and then describes contentment as a secret? As a, it's kind of a strange way to describe contentment. What does all that mean? It means this. Contentment is not something you achieve by being in a relationship or getting a certain job or having a certain number in your bank account. Contentment is something you must learn. It's a secret you must learn. And I think that is both good news and bad news. It's good news because it means you can learn the secret of contentment regardless of your circumstances. You can, you can learn the secret of contentment when you're abounding or when you're being brought low. But the bad news is that you could go your entire life and get everything that you've ever wanted and never be content. You could achieve your five-year plan. You, your life could go better than you ever imagined. You could, you could achieve your wildest dreams and still not achieve the contentment that you long for because contentment, contentment isn't achieved Contentment is a secret that you must learn. I mean, haven't you experienced that in life? Right? You got the new phone, you got the new job, you got the new relationship, and you thought it was going to make you really happy, and you thought, man, if I just have this, then everything will be good. And there's an initial buzz, right, an initial excitement, and then it wears off. And then you find yourself right back in the same place you were before, just with, you know, a more expensive phone, and now you're in a relationship, Right? We've all experienced this again and again. The things that we put our hope in can never deliver in the way that we desire. Why is that? Because contentment is a secret that you must learn. It is not something you achieve. It's something you must learn. But why does Paul describe contentment as a secret? Right? That's kind of a strange way to talk about contentment. Right? Well, here's why. Like a secret, the path to contentment isn't obvious. It's counterintuitive. Like a secret, the path to contentment isn't obvious. It's counterintuitive. And in my experience, I've seen people try to pursue contentment in basically two different ways, neither of, neither of which gets them there, okay? Uh, the first one is what I'll call uh, people who follow the rules 
And the second group I'll call people who follow the fun, okay? So people who follow the rules and people who follow the fun. So rule followers tend to think that contentment comes from getting good grades, right? Pleasing their parents, getting a good job, raising a respectable family, right? Becoming a pillar in the community, right? That's kind of the white picket fence approach. Okay, that's me, all right? So raise your hand if you're a, fo- you're a rule follower, okay? Raise your hand, okay, great, all around the room. All right, now the other group is what I'll call the fun followers. So fun followers tend to think contentment comes from having a good time, right? And experiencing all that life has to offer, good food, good drinks, good vacations, good company, right? They think that is where contentment's going to come from. And contentment is just around the river bend of the next trip to Europe, Okay, so be honest, in your own living room, right, raise your hand if you're a fun follower, okay, if you're a fun follower by disposition, all right. Well, the truth is that neither of those dispositions accomplishes the goal. Can we all just admit that? It's not like all of us rule followers are like, man, I'm so deeply satisfied and content with my life, right? Like, forget you fun follower. You know, it's like neither of them is working. Why? Because contentment is counterintuitive. It's a secret. You... If you just kind of go for it the way that everybody else in the world is going for it, you're never going to get there. But one of the problems, I think, is that we, we often look at other people's lives around us and we think, man, they've all found it, right? They seem so happy all the time. They seem so put together. Their kids always have pants on, right? Their, their Instagram feed is always so well filtered. But if you get close enough, if you really get to know your neighbors or your family members or your friends, you realize that we're all in the same boat, right? There is no path to deep, lasting soul contentment in the world. It's just not there because contentment is a secret. So if contentment is a secret, is Paul going to tell us how to find it? Well, yes, because Paul had found it. Paul cracked the code. Paul knew the secret of contentment, and he's going to tell us what it is. You ready? Here it is. Contentment is found in God. Contentment is found in God. Now, I know that sounds like the ultimate Sunday school answer, like, oh, the pastor said contentment's found in God. Didn't see that coming, right? Like, and, and I admit it, right? It sounds a bit simplistic, a little cliche, but let me just ask you, how is it going for you finding contentment, right? Like, if it's going great, if you're deeply satisfied, full of joy, your circumstances don't assail you, like, you've just been cruising exactly content and happy and peaceful throughout this whole season that we've been in, then keep doing whatever you're doing, okay? It's, it's working for you. But if you're like me and that hasn't been the case, then isn't it worth at least exploring what Paul has to say here, even if it feels a little simplistic or a little cliche? I think it is. So let's look at what Paul means that contentment is found in God. He says it in verse 11 and 13. Paul says in 11, I have learned how to be content in every situation, whether things are going well or things are going bad, whether I, you know, the the date goes well, the date goes badly, whether I get the job or I don't get the job, whether I have a lot of money in my savings account or very little money in my savings account. And then in verse 13, he tells us how, how he learned that. I can do all things, including be content, through God who strengthens me. I can do all things through God who strengthens me. So what does it mean to be strengthened by God? Right? What does it mean to find contentment in God? Well, I think at least two things. Here's letter A if you're a note taker. First, it means believing that your life is father filtered. It means believing that your life and the circumstances of your life are father filtered. What do I mean by that? Well, the Bible teaches us that God is good, that He is all powerful, that He holds all things together, and that He is perfectly wise. All of those things are clearly taught in the scriptures which means that everything that comes into your life first has to pass through your heavenly Father's hands. Everything that comes into your life has to pass through your heavenly Father's hands. If you're single, it's because God wants you to be single. If your career hasn't taken off like your peers has, it's because God hasn't willed it to, right? If something great has happened in your life, it's because God willed it. If something not great has happened in your life, it's because God allowed it. Right? I'm not saying that God has caused all the hard things in your life because sometimes there are tragic results of, of sinful choices that other people make, that we make, and sometimes there's just suffering and brokenness in the world because sin has broken the world. But the fact remains that everything in your life has been filtered through your Father's hand. And if God is in control of your life and you can trust Him, then you can be content regardless of your circumstances. That's what Paul's saying. Paul's saying, hey, if I really believe that God is in control, then he wants me in this dirt prison cell chained to this Roman guard with little food to eat. The God who holds the cosmos together also holds your life together and has you where he intends you to be. It is a posture of trust and a posture of submission that believes that our lives are father filtered. Jeremiah Burroughs was an old Puritan pastor, and he said it this way, Christian contentment 
is that sweet frame of spirit which freely submits so freely submits to and delights in God's wise and fatherly disposal in every condition. Freely submits to and delights in God's wise and fatherly disposal in every condition. Let me ask you, how would your perspective change if you really believe that? How would your perspective change if you really believe that your life was father-filtered? I'll be honest with you, I've had to work really hard to apply that in my own life. There are about 12 things that I wish I was better at as a pastor, okay? I wish I was a better preacher. I wish I was a better counselor. I wish I was a better leader. I wish I was a better voice for justice. I wish I was a better theologian. And that's not false humility. I really wish I was better in all those areas, right? And it can make me really frustrated or insecure. And I can be like, man, why aren't I more gifted? Why aren't I better at this or that? Like, I could help people. I could lead people. And I've just had to come to grips with the fact that if God wanted me to be the next Billy Graham, I would be the next Billy Graham, but he obviously doesn't. Right? I don't know why he has given me the gifts he's given me. I don't know why he's given me the capacity he's given me, right? But he knows. And to put it colloquially, you just have to play the cards that you're dealt. That doesn't mean that I don't want to grow as a leader. It doesn't mean I don't want to grow as a pastor. If you're single, it doesn't mean you can't try to be in a relationship. If, if your career's not going well, it doesn't mean you can't switch careers or go back to school or whatever. It just means recognize that wherever you are, you are there on purpose, Wherever you are, you are there on purpose. Your life is father-filtered. How would it change your perspective if every morning you woke up and said to yourself, the circumstances of my day have been ordained by the wisest creator there is? That my entire life is being organized by the ultimate executive, by the God who never misplaces anything by the God who sees every single detail of my life, and he has put this day together, and he has put these circumstances together. How would your perspective and my perspective change if we believe that, if we apply that every day? We would start to grow in contentment. We would stop looking at what everyone else has and, and wanting what everyone else has, and we would start looking at what we have. And we would say, God, thank you for all the things that you have given me. And God, I, and I believe and I trust God that you haven't given me this thing yet because it must not be for my good. You have a better plan for me. The first thing it means to be content in God is to believe that your life is father-filtered. Well, here's the second way to be strengthened in God, to find contentment in God. Letter B, you need to ask for spiritual strength. That's the second thing that Paul shows us. I mean, in verse 13, Paul connects contentment with strength. That's kind of an interesting connection, isn't it? What that means is, is what you need isn't more stuff or a different spouse or a different job. What you need is spiritual strength. You need strength from God to face every day with the conviction that God has it under control. You need spiritual strength to say, even though it seems like things are out of control, even though my life feels pointless or downcast or like a failure or like a mistake, it is not. The Holy Spirit dwells within me, and God is orchestrating all of my life for His glory and my good. You need spiritual strength to believe that. Romans 8.28 is one of the most powerful and most difficult to believe promises in the Bible. One of the most powerful and, honestly, one of the most difficult promises to really believe in the Bible. It says this, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. All things. Not some things, not most things, not everything but these last couple things that you're really struggling with. All things work together for good. Now, let's be honest, that's very difficult to believe. It's very difficult to believe, isn't it? It's hard for me to believe because sometimes we have no idea. We just can't understand how something that's happened to us or in our lives or that's going on could be for our good. How is unemployment for my good? Right? How is anxiety for my good? How are health challenges for my good? How is racial injustice for my good? How could any of this be for my good, God? Have you seen my life? Have you seen what's happening? I've been trying to do your will. I've been trying to follow your law. I've been trying to be faithful, and everything is falling apart. And Romans 8, 28 sits here defiantly and doesn't change. All things, all things, all things work together for your good. I've got to be honest with you. I can't believe that promise on my own, and you can't believe that promise on your own. There's not enough evidence that you can see to help you believe that promise. You know what you need? You know what I need? We need spiritual strength. We need God to give us strength to believe that promise and to say, God, I don't understand, and this doesn't seem right to me, and I, and I have no idea how you could be, you know, weaving this all together, and yet I believe that you are. Friends, you need to start asking God for spiritual strength. 
Ask God to help you believe His promises, to believe that He really is working in your life even when it seems like He's not. Because if you really believe, if you can get to the point where you say, like the Apostle Paul, God, you are working all this together for my good, then you will discover the secret of contentment. The good news is that God loves to answer those kinds of prayers. He loves to answer the prayers of His children for spiritual strength. The Apostle Paul said uh, that when he, when he had a thorn in his side, right, which is his way of saying a hard circumstance that was really bothering him, and, his, and he cried out to God and said, God, remove this thorn. God said, no, I'm going to leave it there. For my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. So if you feel weak right now, if you feel like you need grace, be encouraged. God hears you, and God will give you what you need. Friends, we need God's strength to be content. So now Paul moves on to verse 14, and he starts talking about generosity. And it can, at first it can seem a little random. Like, all right, we were talking about contentment, and now generosity is like, he just kind of throwing everything together here at the end of this letter. Uh, well, no, I don't think he is. I think there's actually a really important connection between contentment and generosity that I want us to see. So look at verse 14 with me. Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. So after saying that he was quite content without the gift, Paul says, but it was kind of you to send it. Like, I like the gift. I appreciate it. I love it. I'm glad to have some food to eat, and I'm glad to have some, you know, some clothes to wear. He just says, my contentment wasn't based on the gift, but I'm glad that you sent the gift. And then Paul goes on to basically tell us about the generosity of the Philippian church. The Philippian church were the very, was the very first church to partner with Paul financially in his ministry. And even when he left their region and went and did ministry in Thessalonica, they kept supporting him financially. And then Paul says something that's really, really interesting in verse 17. Look at it with me. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I've received full payment and more. I'm well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent. So Paul says, I'm not bringing up your history of generosity to try to get another gift from you. I've got plenty. I mean, I was content before, and now Epaphroditus brought it like, I'm, I'm good. I've got plenty. He says, I just want you to keep being generous so that fruit may increase to your account. Now, now, what is Paul talking about? He's talking about biblical stewardship. He's talking about biblical stewardship. You see, in God's economy, when you invest your time and your money into His mission, God attributes that investment to your spiritual account. Now, I don't know how that works, right? I don't, I don't know how that works in heaven, like, at all, right? And, and this isn't prosperity theology. It's not like Paul's saying, like, you know, give $20 and you'll get $25 back, you know, like God is not a vending machine. But he is saying, hey, when you invest your time and money in the mission of God, God sees that and God credits it to your account, right? Biblical stewardship simply means this. It means treating, recognizing that your time and money belong to God and then treating them accordingly, recognizing that your time and money belong to God and then treating them accordingly. That's what the Philippian church did. They thought of their time and money as belonging to God, as a stewardship from Him, and so they gave those things generously, and Paul rejoiced in that and said, hey, every time you do, fruit increases to your account. It makes me think of Peace Church in Wilson, North Carolina. So, Peace Church in Wilson, North Carolina are some of my favorite people on the planet. So, they are one of our financial supporting churches. So, they agreed for the first three years of our existence to, to partner with us financially to help us get off the ground. And I love Pete's church so much because every time I send them an update about what God is doing here in and through us, they are so excited. They are so excited. They are rejoicing and praising God. They're telling me how proud they are of me and how proud they are of you. Basically, it's like you have a church full of grandparents in Wilson, North Carolina, who are so proud of you. Okay? I mean, they have a picture of my family up in their church lobby, and they pray for us. And they, I mean, it, they are just so overjoyed. Now, let me ask you, why? I mean, they, they don't live in Charlottesville. Nothing that we do here is helping them. It's not helping their church grow, right? It's not good for the bottom line. I mean, they're giving money out of their budget. So why do they get so excited? Because they understand biblical stewardship. They understand that by giving financially and by praying for our ministry, they are a part of our ministry. They are empowering our ministry to happen. And God is attributing our fruit here to their account. Isn't that an amazing thought? That like there's a grandma in Wilson, North Carolina, whose spiritual account is getting fruit from what you're doing, you know, like in the woodlands apartment complex, 
right? It's just, it's just a crazy to think of, to, thing to think about, but that is how God's economy works. Peace Church understands biblical stewardship. And then, then Paul explains that when we practice biblical stewardship, we're not, just, we're not just giving to God's mission and moving the mission of the gospel forward. We're actually worshiping God. Look at verse 18. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. Here's what this teaches us, friends. Giving isn't separate from worship. Giving is an act of worship. Giving isn't separate from worship. Giving is an act of worship. That's why every time we take up our tithes and offerings, we say, hey, I want to invite you to continue to worship by the giving of your tithes and offerings. When we give of our time and of our resources to the mission of God, it is an act of praise. It is us saying, God, you are the most valuable thing in my life, so I'm going to give you my time and I'm going to give money to your mission because you are worthy. And when we do that, it is pleasing to God and it is an act of worship because giving is not separate from worship, friends. It is an act of worship. So, how does this, how does this have to do with contentment, right? I told you that it did. Well, it, it's a pretty simple connection, and here's what it is. You ready? Content people become generous people. Content people become generous people. I mean, doesn't that follow, right? If, if my contentment and your contentment is wrapped up in stuff, right, and how big our house is and how new our car is and, and what kind of clothes we wear and what kind of vacations we can go on and restaurants we can eat at. If our content, none of those things are bad, but if our contentment is wrapped up in those things, it's going to be very difficult for us to be generous. Because at that point, we're not just giving our time and our money, we're giving our satisfaction. We're giving our joy. Our deep-seated contentment is being threatened. But flip that around. What if you started to become like the Apostle Paul? And what if you said, my contentment is in God, it's in Christ, I'm so satisfied in Him that whether I have a lot or a little, whether I'm eating at, you know, Ruth's Chris or McDonald's, whether I'm flying first class or on the bus, I'm so deeply satisfied, what would that enable you to do in terms of generosity? Radical things. Philippian church-like things. Why? Because you wouldn't need the stuff. You wouldn't need the newest car. You wouldn't need the newest clothes. You wouldn't need the biggest house to be content. You had your contentment in Christ and so you can say, hey, I have enough. I have enough so I can give. I, I have enough so I can invest my time and I can invest my talents and I can invest my treasure in the mission of God. Friends, content people become generous people. Apparently, the Philippian church had learned the secret of contentment as well because they were a radically generous congregation. But this is pretty challenging, isn't it? I mean, can we just be honest? Let me ask you a pretty challenging question. What does your level of generosity say about your level of contentment? What does your level of generosity say about your level of contentment? Does it say that you're content in the Lord? Or does it say that you're trying to find contentment in the world? And I don't say that from a place of pride. I mean, I've wrestled with that question myself this week. It's so easy to sort of, to sort of blend into the lane of finding contentment in the world and of things going well. But Paul says, hey, if you're content in Christ, you can be radically generous. You can make a huge impact with your life, just like the Philippian church did. And then he closes with good news that I want to close with as well. Look at verse 19. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. When you give generously to the kingdom of God, God promises to provide for your needs. When you give generously to the kingdom of God, God promises to provide for your needs. Jesus said it this way in Matthew 6, 33, but seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. All the things that you need will be added unto you. But if you're anything like me, it makes you nervous right? You think, man, if I give my time, if I give my money, if, if I give up these things in the world that I'm looking for, what if God doesn't come through? What if I don't achieve that contentment that I'm looking for? What if, what if God doesn't provide the needs that I have? What if, what if ends don't meet? How do we find the faith to actually start living this way? We find it by remembering the cross. The cross is the most powerful example in history of someone being radically generous because they are deeply content. Jesus was so content in His relationship with the Father and the Spirit. He was so content with His acceptance with His Father and with the Spirit that He gave up everything. He gave up His riches. He gave up His power. He gave up His authority, and He hung on a cross to pay for your sins and for my sins, to pay for the sins of the world. If God gave up Christ so that you could be forgiven, you can trust Him to give you what you need. 
if God gave up His precious Son to suffer and to die in your place, and then if God is powerful enough to, powerful enough to raise Jesus from the dead, then, friend, you can trust God to be your source of contentment, and you can trust God to give you everything that you need. Let's come together together. Let's help one another believe this together, that we might be like the Philippian church, a group of people that makes a difference in this world because we are content in Christ, and as a result, we are generous towards others. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your generosity towards us. God, that you're just generous in nature, that you you created an amazing world, and that you're gracious and kind. Father, would you help us to trust you? Would you help us to seek our contentment in you? Would you strengthen us, Lord, to believe your promises even when we can't see how they could be true? Help us to believe by faith. Would you help us now to worship God? Worship because you're worthy and worship because of what you've done for us in Christ. We love you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.